Welcome, everyone, to the Student Loan Planner Podcast. I have got a very special guest today to talk about whether or not you can just settle your student loan debt, or maybe you can bankrupt it, or maybe you can wipe it away with a magic wand, or actually maybe you can use some really intelligent legal strategies to settle it. I would say this is not going to apply to most people in our audience, but to the people out there that it could help, it could be really a transformational podcast today. So we've got Christy Arkovich. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it, Travis. I really hope your listeners can learn something. We can get rid of some of the debt for them. Yeah. I just want you to just start off just by introducing yourself. And in preparation for this, I guess a good analogy would be like you're a Star Wars character uh, that came (laughs) over from the dark side to defend the Jedi. So why am I saying that? And maybe just introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. Uh, Well, my name is Christy Arkovich. I'm in Tampa, Florida. And I've been doing student loan work forever. I used to work for the dark side, like you mentioned. So we've been working mostly for consumers for a number of years now and just doing tons of really great things with student loan debt, getting rid of it once and for all, making it manageable, sustainable, don't have to file a bankruptcy necessarily. And we are just seeing incredible results. And in all my areas of practice, I think I've got the happiest clients in this particular area. So it's been nice. So I think you're being too modest. So could you talk about your student loan specific area of expertise or experience? Sure. Back in the 90s, I used to represent Sally May, ECMC, a lot of the guarantors, USA Funds and Terry and things. And I read around the state of Florida. Uh, we did trials where we were opposing student loan discharges. And back then, I believed in the student loan system. You know, when I graduated, I had a roughly one-to-one ratio. My first job paid, I think it was 40000 And my, my loan balance after a private school, private law school, and two years of private undergrad was only 45. So that one-to-one ratio was easy for me to repay. And I I thought it was a great system. And I wouldn't be a lawyer today if it wasn't for that system. But since then, I've come to realize that it's definitely broken. And there's a lot of ways it can be improved. There's a lot of problems. And so I have switched sides a number of years ago. Currently, the servicers are not doing that great of a job of managing the debt for the consumers. And in part, it's because the consumer is not their client. Their client is actually the people that are owed the money, the creditors. And so there's folks out there that, you know, they are faced with one of the biggest debts of their lives and there's nowhere to turn because if they're listening to the servicer, that's the debt collector, that's the other side. And so they need to find information elsewhere. And that's kind of where we come in. Could you talk about the FFEL world? Because I think a lot of people, when they heard guarantors and ECMC and Sally May and everything, you know, a lot of these, you know, Navy and student loan trust, right? A lot of these older FFEL loans from the system before, back before 2010 was the way we did things. So could you kind of just explain to our listeners the way student loans used to work with the, you know, private lenders being guaranteed by the government? Absolutely. It's called the Federal Family Education Loan Program. It's FEL or FELP. And prior to 2010, 80% of federal loans were FEL loans. They were basically privately originated through Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Sally Mae, private companies. And they were funded and only guaranteed by the government. So therefore, they're actually owned by a third party. And so a number of presidents tried to eliminate that system, starting with President Clinton, President Bush, and so forth. And finally, President Obama was successful in eliminating the FEL program in mid-2010. And so every loan thereafter is direct. And the difference is this, and it's easy to see with the CARES Act, for instance, that was passed in March, which it allowed for forbearance and interest waivers during COVID, it only applied to direct loans. And so we've seen a lot of people accidentally default because they have FEL loans, they have direct loans, they have some Perkins loans, they have some private loans. Well, only the direct loans are given the governmental protections during COVID. None of those other loans, private loans are still due. If they want to garnish and things, they can Fell loans were different as well as Perkins and so forth. And so folks don't know what they have. And so they don't know what they're eligible for. Are these private loan guarantors, the people that have these FFEL or FEL loans, as we call them, or do they have some sort of special legal protections? Why President Trump and President Biden were not able to include those in the interest in, in payment pause for the CARES Act? Well, it's really the lobbyists at the time. These lenders spent a huge amount of money lobbying Congress to keep the FEL program in place. That tells you how profitable it is for them to spend that much money in that. And it's one of the problems that we see with public service loan forgiveness because fell loans, you would think, well, let's see, if I suggest to someone, they're a teacher, they're a police officer, that they consolidate their loans to direct so they get public service loan forgiveness, you think that would be a great thing, that fell lender would get paid. But what happens is their servicing stream of income stops. Their portfolio shrinks drastically if all those um, public service loans were all of a sudden just paid off by the government. 
So the fell loans have been a problem because they're not eligible for a lot of programs and the lobbyists kept pushing them for longer than they really needed to be around. Yeah. I mean, you kind of can sort of see that with, I guess, maybe a stream of income was declining as the fellow loan mm-hmm. program eventually was going out of business, you know, with this long stream of slow death, you could call it of the fellow loan program. And so then they would purchase earnest, I think, as a way of sort of diversifying against that. So it's pretty interesting. So for the fell loan program, back in the mid 2000s, occasionally we come into clients that have two or 3% interest rates on their student loans and their federal fell loans from this sort of mid 2000s period. How was that profitable to some of these lenders? Because, you know, the 10 year treasury yield during that time was greater than some of the interest rates that we see on some of these loans. So was Congress paying some of the lenders to subsidize the student loan interest rates back in the day? Actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think my pay grade is high enough. You might know more about that topic than I do. <laughs> well, it's just it's just a weird thing that I've seen, right? So like yeah. sometimes people like, for example, I guess a common rate is like 2.8% for like a 30-year type loan that I've seen occasionally for people that borrowed for graduate school in the mid-2000s. It seems like it's kind of a very narrow window as to when people had to have gone to school when we see that. But it is kind of interesting to see those interest rates on loans being so much higher now than they were back in the day, at least for this federal loan program. It is a narrow time period because the average for federal loans is 6.8%. And we see a lot of grad loans at 8, 8.5, including Parent Plus and Grad Plus loans. And if you do a consolidation, it's supposed to be market weighted to what the prior rate was before based on the number of notes that are now being consolidated and what their individual rates were. But there was a brief time where you did have lower interest rates. And that is one of the things that you know, we are expecting maybe some additional student loan stimulus to come out, maybe in a separate package. And one across the board remedy for a lot of problems would be a simple 3% rate across the board, every federal loan. Yeah. What do you think the chances are that they would actually do something like that? Not bad. The only part in the current $1.9 trillion stimulus was tax relief. And that's pretty great. Anyone who gets any kind of forgiveness of any sort, public or private, through the end of 2025, we'll have a tax event. And so that's being waived. That's huge. That's the only part addressing student loans in that entire $1.9 trillion. So what that means to us is that we will see a second package addressed you know, solely for student loans. And they've indicated an interest to forgive $10,000 across the board. Maybe there would be an income cap. They've indicated an interest to fix public service. The 3% thing is something that I've talked a lot about, but I'm not sure how much support congressionally that has, but it would be a wide across the board and it would eliminate the counter argument, which is why should we forgive someone's loan when they went to a particular school and agreed contractually to pay something back? Why should the taxpayers now support that? If someone has worked hard through school or maybe they didn't go to school, you know, why should they now end up having to pay as a taxpayer those that did go to school and so forth. So I get those arguments as well. If you were to just end the uncontrollable aspect, which is the high interest rates, that would end a lot of our problems right there. People, they don't want to renege on the deal. You know, they'd like to repay the student loan debt. What they can't repay is the craziness that has occurred where when they graduated, they owed 20000 and now they owe 80000 They can't afford that kind of thing. Sure. I mean, so what would you say to the argument that, you know, the student loan interest rates at 6.8% are already subsidized compared to what private companies would charge for privately originated loans? Well, so far, a lot of their rates are 4% right now. So we see lower rates than 68 out there in today's current marketplace. That's true. I mean, that would be for the most qualified people, though, versus your, your average borrower, right? But it is yeah. a certainly interesting idea. I just, I wonder, like, I've told people not to expect that simply because like the reconciliation process is like super interesting. Like I've been kind of reading about, you know, how and when they can use this process. And it seems like, I guess, from my research that they get to use it one more time. You know, you get sort of one reconciliation a year if you involve like multiple things. And so it's interesting to see, because I guess Senator Joe Manchin was the one that sponsored the Bipartisan Student Loan Certainty Act that set the current formula for interest rates. It's really kind of interesting to see if that would be on the table. So they said it sounded like the New York Times recently said they're going to do infrastructure and then they're going to do their right. education one. So sounds like we're not going to have any idea as to what they're going to do uh, on student loans, probably until the late spring at the earliest, I would guess. Yeah, I was guessing around midsummer. The current forbearance ends the end of September. So I'm guessing around July or so, maybe we'll start to see what they have in mind for student loans. Before that, it'll probably be infrastructure, like you mentioned. Yeah, well, it'll um, be interesting. 
so to just jump on a couple hot topics. So one is loan rehabilitation. So if somebody was in default prior to, you know, the CARES Act suspending everything, you've got 18 months of that'll cover the nine months probably towards rehabilitation. So could you talk about how loan rehabilitation could really be a historic opportunity for somebody because of the CARES Act? One of the things that we want to do is try to take advantage of the COVID period to get someone in a better shape than what they would have been had it not been for COVID. And for rehab, for instance, one of the key factors is that there's no garnishment going on. When you rehab a loan, it's a nine-month process to rehabilitate the loan, and you basically negotiate a payment plan. It could be as little as 5 or $10, but the problem is, is during the first half of the rehab period, which is five months, the garnishment that may have been in place prior to COVID would have kept running had it not been for COVID. So you'd have 10 paychecks, basically 10 pay periods that would be garnished at 15%. So with COVID, we don't have that. And so someone can rehab basically for free. They have that very low payment, whatever it is. And then when they come out the other end of COVID, they would end up with you know not having a wage garnishment order and their loan is cured. Uh, the default is removed. The lates would remain on their payment, on their um, credit report, but basically they'd be eligible for any income-driven plan come October then. So the problem is a lot of the servicers are dragging their heels a little bit with rehabs. They get it. They're not getting the kind of income that they would normally see with a garnishment uh, that would be used to pay off debt collection fees. So they're dragging their heels. And it is a little bit of a problem because they're losing our authorization letters. We're calling them constantly to try to get our clients enrolled in those rehabs while the time is good. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's such an opportunity. I mean, like, you know, dealing with a lot of people that have had that issue, such a wonderful opportunity to take some bad stuff off your credit report and get on back on the repayment train, yeah. so to speak. So another really hot topic is borrower defense to repayment. So uh, it was announced that they were going to forgive, I think, 60 or 70,000 something students who've sort of been in limbo with that. I think everyone knows the ITT Tech and Corinthian College for-profit chain examples. Our audience tends to be more graduate degree professionals. So curious as to what you think of all of that. And also like, for example, like Charlotte School of Law, Argosy shutting down. What would somebody that wants to claim their school defrauded them need to do to have a reasonable shot at getting success with their loans being canceled? Well, that program has a long history behind it, and we pretty much marked it off for debt a little while ago. So we're very happy to see that the Biden administration and the new Secretary of Education is revamping it. And so I just read the other day that uh, for the 72,000 borrowers who did receive some approval, now we had a few of those and they received only 10% forgiveness of their entire loan balance, which was very, very small. It basically was affording a billion dollars to be divided among those 72,000 that had already been approved. My calculator didn't go that high to try to divide a billion dollars by 72,000 to see how much that could be per you know, borrower. And some of our clients have reached back out to us to see what it means for them, because if they had 10% written off before, it may be 50 or 100% now. So that's fantastic news because 10% was a drop in the bucket and it's a huge problem for them. Borrower defense, what happened originally was it was a small, like two sentences out of Congress that if someone felt they were defrauded or the victim of some kind of false misrepresentation, that they could assert a defense towards a federal loan. It was only a couple of lines. And so back when Corinthian and Everest and things filed bankruptcy, the Department of Ed decided it needed to create a program and create rules and an application process and things. And so they did so. And it took a couple of years and 700 some pages, and it's been changed here and there. And so people filed those applications and such. And initially they were being approved. But then when Secretary DeVos took over, the program was put on hold. And only in a few court cases last year was she finally in a position where she agreed to go ahead and review those pending applications. But they were pretty much all denied. And so that's been reopened as to whether or not anyone gave a fair shake to those applications. And I just read an article that said each application was given about, what, about 12 minutes or so of review, even though the application itself with all the documents attached might have been hundreds of pages. So for anyone who's not been approved, they're in the review process, they definitely need to hang in there because they're going to revamp the rules going forward to go back to what they used to be. And anyone who is in a school now There's two ways to go about it if the school closes. You could go after the simple mathematical, have you attended the school within 120 days of it closing, in which case there's an application for a closed school discharge. Many people, they haven't been at that school for 120 days, though. So they need to file what's called a borrower defense to repayment application. It's a rather lengthy application. It's got a few sections. Basically, what it focuses on are those that the school has represented or misrepresented, I should say, the cost of attendance 
maybe the accreditation of the school, the transferability of credits, that's a big one. The job qualifications, placement and salary upon graduation and things, they often will count someone's prior job that many of these people just go back to. They just go back to the same job they had before they went to it t for instance. That's a big deal. And so anyone new that fits those definitions where they believe that whatever they were told was false from the get-go, then they should absolutely file a new application because the rules are going to be revamped. And the billion dollars that was set aside for the people who already had some partial relief, that'll be used for that. We don't know what will be used and what the new rules will be, but I'm very encouraged if they're going to give a billion dollars to give additional approvals to those who've already had approvals, then certainly the ones that are being reviewed and new ones, the barn doors open. So I think everyone should file if they can. So one of our frustrations historically has been the for-profit schools absolutely are accountable for some of the worst abuses, right? Like we certainly know that's the case for a lot of the for-profit schools. In my opinion, for-profit schools shouldn't even qualify for federal financial aid personally. But for one interesting thing is what if somebody goes to a high cost nonprofit dental school. So that's one thing that's kind of been historically absent uh, from borrower defense to repayment is, you know, nonprofit high quality names, prestigious names, uh, you know, that just absolutely misrepresent the cost of attendance and, and outcomes to borrowers. Just one example I'm thinking of, I don't want to say the name, uh, you know, for opening myself up, but this school has lied to people in the admissions process repeatedly saying that it only takes people seven years to pay back their loans on average after attendance. And the (laughs) amount of money they'd have to pay is more than their graduates earn to make Mm -hmm. that mathematically possible. So that's certainly a misrepresentation. And, you know, that same school actually recently pulled off the room and board part of their cost of attendance estimate because it made their school look so bad in terms Hmm. of the total overall cost. So, I mean, you know, do you think that there's any hope for, because the thing is is oftentimes like, you know, income-based repayments are a really good option for these folks and they make, you know, significantly above average incomes. They're gainfully employed. They're able to pay their 10% or whatever they, whatever it is. And they're, they're not harmed. You could say from a financial standpoint, given IBR, But given those nonprofit schools so grossly misrepresented things to them, do you think that people should just throw their hat in the ring? Is there any negative consequence to people uh, that went to nonprofit schools applying for borrower defense repayment and then getting rejected? Would that harm them in any way? No, what they could do is they could remain on an income-driven plan. And then the current rules basically say that while the application is being reviewed, if it takes too long, like longer than I think it was a year or 18 months, that the interest would be waived from that point forward. But there's no harm. And if they have direct loans, they would actually be entitled to a refund if the Department of Ed would you know, approve their application at some point. Before, when President Obama was in charge of the program, they were continually updating the years and the areas of study and the schools that were being added to the list of potential candidates for this program. That stopped when Secretary DeVos took over. I imagine that will restart where they're going to look at additional schools. So I would encourage everyone to file because the way they choose what schools are going to look at is how many applications are they receiving from this particular dental school? Are they getting a boatload? Maybe they should look at whether or not those representations are false or not. I would argue that what you just said would be very misleading if someone is told it only takes seven years to repay, but yet the graduation pay rate would not sustain that. I think that would be misleading. And we have a Florida Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act that would provide a basis to make that allegation. Yeah, that's really interesting. So sounds like folks, if you feel like you were defrauded by your school for whatever reason, sounds like there's no downside to, I I assume that you can just type in borrower defense to repayment application in Google and probably find the appropriate form. Exactly. And there's a nice FAQ right on the Department of Ed's website. They don't need to hire an attorney to do that. They can do that themselves. And the key there is to be as specific as possible. So you don't want to just allege generalities. You want to use years, people's names, whatever you can remember, any business cards you might have kept, any specific statements that may have been made to you. Ask relatives too. You might have forgot, but somebody else might have attended the financial aid portion with you. They may remember something far better than you would, and they might jog your memory. So try to gather as much specific information as possible. Wow, that's great. And also discharges are tax-free until the end of 2025 because of the American Recovery Plan. So I think you're going to see there's like 300,000 applications and 70-something thousand people approved. I think that number is going to go up a lot. I just hope that all the bad actors get attention. You know, the for-profits, the not-for-profits, anybody who's misled students, I really hope they get their just desserts, but I'm not holding my breath. Agreed. And I think the tax uh, benefits are huge because we've been doing a lot of total and permanent disability applications in the past year. 
And in part, COVID has sort of accelerated that because I've encouraged people who are in their 50s and 60s that if they are in a position that they aren't willing to return to work or their employment doesn't really want them to return either, or they have COVID symptoms or long haul type symptoms, maybe now would be the time to take advantage of the total and permanent disability discharge. If you can't return to work full time doing what you used to do, that is 100% tax free discharge. And the tax free has been a huge marketing point for that. We, for instance, had a neurosurgeon that was in his mid-70s, still working, still operating. And he came to me and um, he was fearful of continuing to work at his age. You know, he felt that he wasn't able to do it as well as he used to. And he was getting concerned about that. But he also couldn't afford forgiveness because he felt that he would be taxed. And if he owes a million dollars for all these parent plus loans with his children, then his tax rate, he'd be up to 500,000 in an IRS debt. Well, it's tax-free. And so that was a huge focus. He was an immediate client of ours once he realized that. He didn't know when he came in to see us. So this benefit now with the Stimulus Act, allowing for any forgiveness to be tax-free through 2025, is very similar to that. There's no reason not to try for these things because you're not going to get an IRS bill when it's over. That's great. So let's switch gears to talk about private student loans. Could you talk about when something like a statute of limitations applies? A lot of times it's state specific. So could you just give like a sort of a basic explanation of what is a statute of limitations and why does it depend on where you live sometimes on how good sure. of a settlement you get with private student debt? Well, a lot of people, they confuse the statute of limitations with the limits as to how long something can remain on your credit report. So a debt can remain on someone's credit report for seven years. A statute of limitations can be both shorter or longer. What it is, is essentially a deadline by which whoever is the creditor has to file a lawsuit. And the purpose behind a statute of limitations is documents are lost, witness memories are lost. So they encourage people to go to court while that stuff is fresh to have something to argue. It varies from state to state. Here in Florida, where I am, the statute of limitations is five years. But what we do is we look at the account agreement, the promissory note, whatever it is that our client has signed and its terms and conditions, because the creditor may have had a state count or clause in there that's a different uh, forum state, which basically means Alaska law would apply or Ohio law would apply. And doesn't necessarily make a difference on where that person went to school, where they live now, where the, you know any of that kind of stuff. Ohio, for instance, is 15. That's the longest I've seen. California is four. A number of them are between four and six. So generally it's a between four and six. And so some of our clients, they, they think that that time period starts running back when they sign the note, when they incurred the debt. And that's not accurate. A statute of limitations does not begin to run until a creditor needs to take some action. So think of it this way. If someone doesn't make a payment and a payment is due, that's when it starts. So if someone never paid on a student loan, it would normally start about six months after graduation. There's always a six-month deferment, usually. Um, Not always, but usually. And then there may be tolling of the statute of limitations. If someone is in school, there's an in-school deferment. If they're in the military, um, if they're out of the country, there could be a tolling event. But for the most part, the statute of limitations is that bar, and it's waivable. So we encourage that if folks are sued in state court uh, by National Collegiate Student Loan Trust, by Navient, Sally May Trust, whoever it is, uh, one of the things they need to do is always make sure they have an affirmative defense listed and maybe hire an attorney if they don't know how to do this to raise the statute of limitations because it is a waivable defense. If it's not raised, it's waived. And sometimes it's an excellent bar to recovery. One of the ways someone, a borrower, can see if a statute of limitations might have run in their case is just look at the letters that they're being sent. A creditor is supposed to, at the bottom of the letter, provide something like this debt is no longer legally enforceable or something like that as a signal that the statute of limitations is, has run. Um, a lot of times they'll make an offer of 10%. Uh, that's kind of a key to me that the statute of limitations is probably run. Why would someone pay 10% on a debt they can't be sued for? Closure. They want to know for sure. Because what happens if somebody buys that debt, they sue them anyway in a, in a state or county they used to live in. The person doesn't even know they're being sued. All of a sudden now they have a judgment against them because they didn't show up in court and they didn't allege that the statute of limitations hadn't been waived. So they want closure. They want to be done with it. So we do do some settlements in that regard. We have found, though, with private student loans, there's something that's working really, really well. Do you know much about them being able to be discharged in bankruptcy? Not a whole lot, which is why I wanted to have you on the show. (laughs) We are having tremendous success in that, and we're one of the larger filers in the nation doing this. And so what we do is we reopen an old bankruptcy or we file a new bankruptcy, and we allege that that private student loan is not a qualified education loan. You mentioned a moment ago that one of the schools had removed room and board from its cost of attendance. That's one of the things we look at. We look at, is the debt incurred beyond the cost of attendance? 
because we have a situation back in 2005 and six where the bankruptcy code was amended and they made private loans non-dischargeable in bankruptcy, same as federal loans. So they gave them this protection. But what happened then is a lot of private loans didn't use the nonprofit guarantee. They didn't feel they needed it anymore. So that works to our advantage. And then secondly, they loan more than they should have. You know, basically they thought, well, I'd like to target borrowers out there who are students because I can sell that debt for more money. It can never be gotten rid of or discharged in a bankruptcy. So let's market to students. I don't care what they use it for. Let's give them as much as they'll possibly take. And the students, they're 19. They don't know any better. They take as much as they can. I've actually talked to the number of clients who say, I didn't think that they would loan me more than I could afford to repay. Why would they? They're a business. They make a business decision. So I felt that with my degree, I would be able to easily make enough money to pay this debt back. And they don't know the trap they got into. And let's say they learned that they were into it and it had a high interest rate and there were co-borrowers, 15% interest rate so far. Let's say they're a sophomore, they're halfway through. Well, who stops? Even if they realize that they made a poor decision when they were 18 or 19, maybe they're 20 or 21, they have another couple of years left. You can't stop then. You have to see it through you know, to get the degree and see what happens. So then by now the debt is hundred grand. They recognize they can't repay it. Anyway, so what we're doing in bankruptcy is we're saying that these loans were never true student loans to begin with. They've always been a consumer loan. They're predatory. They have high interest rates. They have borrowers. I mean, they have co-borrowers. And we're able to often get rid of those and discharge them in a bankruptcy, either in full or in part with a really good settlement option. That's really interesting. Can you talk about the, I read in one of your other uh, podcasts, this strategy of asking them to not call your cell phone and using that as (laughs) leverage in a settlement offer. Could you, so can you explain, I mean, this almost sounded too good to be true and I read about it, but you know, if you are needing to negotiate a settlement, can you talk about how something like your cell phone number could be used as leverage? Well, it is too good to be true now because the laws have changed since then. Oh, nuts. We we were very successful for a number of years where we would have our clients call and see what the company can do for them. And if they were able to work it out, great, fantastic, then the situation's resolved. But invariably, they would have to give over you know, their address, their cell phone number, their this and their that in order to um, see what the company could do for them. And that would start cell phone calls. And even though they weren't able to reach an agreement and our client was unable to afford the payment plan that they had represented that would work for them, what happened was the cell phone calls would never stop. You know, our client would continually ask for them to stop calling them and the creditors would continue to call. So that's a TCPA, a Telephone Consumer Protection Act violation. It's a violation that awards damages of $1,500 per call. The problem is, is here in the Middle District of Florida, there are some cases that basically say, if there is human intervention of any kind, if you have a human that's pressing enter, you know, spamming enter to start the call, that's enough. And I don't personally agree with that. I think that you know it has to have more than just someone spamming an enter key. You've got to have a human that decides what to say, who to say it to, what time of day to say it, how often to say it. Those decisions are being made to create what those phone call scripts are to collect that debt. And if a human is involved in all that, then sure, the automatic you know, auto dialer is basically taken out of the equation and therefore the TCPA may not apply. But if you just have a, a human hitting a button and to start a call that from that point on is completely mechanical and all automated and robotic and all that, why shouldn't the TCPA apply? But I'm not a judge and so I can't make that decision. And so we don't really rely on cell phone violations anymore. One focus we have turned to is Fair Credit Reporting Act violations instead, because we'll see that a debt is misrepresented. You know, we may have a settlement, for instance, and a creditor doesn't update the credit report to show that now we have a settlement. It's either lump sum or a payment plan. And what happens is, is they'll report the debt is still being delinquent, still a larger balance than what we've agreed upon, or maybe in charge off status. All of that hurts someone's credit. So post-settlement, we're seeing a lot of violations like that that we do pursue if the creditor doesn't fix the credit reports after our settlement. So clearly, if I am not aware of these strategies for legal defense, our listeners are not going to be aware of these strategies either, which is why you know if you are being pursued, if you are in default, you definitely need somebody in your corner. I want to ask a few more questions. So obviously uh, there's Caribbean medical schools, right? And that Mm -hmm. kind of blew my mind that, you know, you had schools in the Caribbean for profit in some cases owned by like foreign investors that were eligible for federal financial aid that in some cases had 50% rates of dropping out. It Mm -hmm. just kind of floored me how they were able to finagle that qualification in. 
So there's, I think you mentioned maybe a recent case with Caribbean medical schools. Do anybody that, you know, go to these sort of, you know, non-US based programs, do, do these folks have any hope of a, you know, of a discharge in some cases for federal or private debt? They do. And I'm really glad you asked that because I think it's a large problem that is basically being unaddressed. One of our very first cases that we sought to discharge private student loan debt was a client who attended, I think it was St. Matthew's, a Caribbean school uh, down there. And it wasn't eligible for federal funding, which meant that this was a debt that I could discharge in full, this private student loan debt. And we did so in Orlando, Florida, back in like 2016 or 17 or so. You mentioned that a lot of folks are not able to graduate. There's also a problem where even if they graduate, they can't pass their boards. Yep. And they spend years trying to do so. And finally, they may do so, but it's five or 10 years later where their debt is doubled or tripled by then. So that's a problem. But I realized back when we had that one case that there's approximately 50 medical schools in the Caribbean. I couldn't believe it. And only three or four are eligible for federal funding. So you mentioned that you were surprised that the federal government actually provides funds, but the vast majority of these schools, in reality, they're funded by private money, either you know family money or private loans. And those private loans are dischargeable if the school is not eligible for federal funding. And when you look at the school's websites, it may say, oh, yes, we're accredited, but they're accredited by the island something or another. Who cares? You know, They're not on the federal school code list for eligibility for federal funds, which means we can get rid of them in bankruptcy. For federal loans, you still have that borrower defense to repayment if the school has been inaccurate in any of its representations. And and representations are important. One other thing I'd like to focus on, since then I think that is going to be a big growing area here in the, in the near future, is to focus on what the school told you from the get-go. Uh, let's say a teacher you know, resigned or quit mid-year and they hired a replacement and the replacement was never any good. Well, that's not fraud. That might be mismanagement, but it's not fraud. Fraud are things that whatever the school or its admissions office or whatnot told you from the very beginning, and that encourage you to then to take out those loans, those would be misrepresentations that um, would be dischargeable through the borrower defense program. It's going to be really interesting to see if you have a mass flood of applications after this <laughs> and then like the cost of the, you know, because obviously somebody's paying for this, right? I mean, it's students or taxpayers too, obviously. So it's us collectively paying for these schools that defrauded people. I've always been frustrated. There's like almost no regulation, it seems like, on, on a lot of these schools. It's just unreal. And, yeah. you know, I, I have this example, this analogy I'd love to use, and it's l- much like lemon laws. Everyone's bought a car before in their life. So let's say you buy a vehicle and it's a lemon and it never drives up a lot. So a lot of people think, well, you know, you're know, you going to get a free education if you have an approval under borrowed defense. You get all this benefit from this free education. Why is that fair? Well, in reality, that borrower spent four years of their life buying a car that never drove off the lot. Their degree is worthless. Employers have told them to leave that school off the resume. It can only hurt them. Right now, they've used all their federal eligibility. They can't go back to school again. Now they might have kids or something. They don't have the time to go back to school. So they don't have the money. They don't have the time. So they are screwed in that regard for the remainder of their life because they don't have that longevity of career. Maybe it's 10 years in by now. They've lost out on that even if they were to restart over. They're not getting anything free. It's not even putting them back to where they would have been. It's just trying to do something for them. Many of them, you know, they might be able to get some federal aid to do some trade schools or something like that. But we see a lot of folks that are, you know, waitressing or doing jobs that require no degree whatsoever, and they have a master's or bachelor's at one of these schools. It's pretty fascinating situation. So I, I get this question a ton. Someone will send me an email that has a good credit score, good income, no economic distress, except their student loans are causing them a lot of anxiety. And the the email that I get goes something like this. Can I just call Fed Loan and offer them 150 grand on my 250 grand uh, debt? And can I just get it done? Like, so what, what would you tell someone, uh, you know, a physician who wants to just say settle her her 250 grand debt for a lower amount because she's got that money in cash to settle it? I would say now I understand, and it would be a good business decision for the government to do that. But there is a zero percent chance of that happening right now. Now, if the Biden administration does look at settlement differently, that could change. Uh, but right now, if someone were in default, they will waive the 25% collection costs. I don't know if you knew this, but if someone defaults, they add 25% to the balance. And it's huge. And a lot of people default more than once. They will waive that. And they'll sometimes waive 10 to 30% of the principal and or interest. Sometimes they won't waive any. They're somewhat difficult to work with. But we don't know with the Biden administration if they might change that. So I would encourage if someone wants to do that, maybe wait a few months for the Department of Ed to figure out what its new rules are going forward under the new management, basically. 
and see if uh, they want to make a business offer. You know, I have one client, for instance, right now that she's a teacher with, I think, two years yet to go. So she'd like to resign now and have the benefit of public service loan forgiveness. She'd like to offer them cash for what she would have had to pay had she remained working for another two years. They would never entertain that offer now, later, maybe. Um, You never know. It really is a fascinating question about settlement of of debt. I mean, like, I think that if I was one of those consumers facing that 10% settlement offer for a debt that I didn't even technically legally owe anymore because it was past the statute of limitations, I have to tell you, I'd be tempted to pay the 10% Mm -hmm. just because, like, obviously, as a business, you face legal issues, uh, you know, from everything from legitimate to like trolls, like auto filing, all these things. It's such a peace of mind to like, no, you're not going to see it again. And then they don't have to worry about it being sold to a bottom feeder that might yeah. sue anyway. I mean, back in the days of uh, the foreclosure crisis, there was a study that came out on chapter seven debt and chapter seven debt has no value. You can never file a lawsuit based on debt that's been discharged in a chapter seven, but yet it had a value. They would securitize it. They would put it in a big fund and they would sell it. The point is, is that enough bottom feeders would buy it They'd either wait for a title company to reach out to them out of the blue 24 hours before a house sale to clear off a debt from a credit report, or one of their phone calls would get somebody on the other side that's willing to give a credit card number. You know, somebody would pay enough that let's say they securitize that debt and they paid one cent on the dollar, they'd make back five cents. So that's five times your money. That's a 500% return on a securitized debt that should never, ever be collected upon. There's such shady stuff in the student loan world. I know I frequently will get you know, unsolicited spam messages from people offering me tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of names and credit locations and, you know, uh, phone numbers and emails and everything of groups that sell this information. Somehow they found it to organizations that, you know, do all kinds Mm -hmm. of sketchy stuff with it. It's pretty scary out there. Um, I'd also like to um, say one thing for your listeners, because of these different forgiveness programs, it's going to spark up a lot more spam calls. And so Sally May or Navient were one of the big ones. They called my mother-in-law a few few weeks ago and she's like 80 years old and never had a student loan. And they tried to talk with her about her student loan forgiveness that she's eligible for. (laughs) So they're looking for personal information. So the key is, is that if anyone calls you about your student loans, make sure they tell you the personal information to identify who they are, or you call the company back from its publicized website, address, phone numbers, rather than just willy-nilly giving personal information over the phone to someone who promises forgiveness. You know, I really don't know any legitimate people that make outbound phone calls about student loans ever. I mean, maybe besides maybe a debt collector or something like that that has the legal right to. I mean, you know, is there ever a case where somebody would legitimately call you about your student loans, like an outbound call? Um, Well, the government assigns all of its contracts to private servicers and private debt collectors. And unfortunately, it can switch without someone knowing it or giving their permission. They may think they have a relationship with A, but they get a call from B. So it can happen, but the government just doesn't call people and tell them, hey, there's this forgiveness available. The studentaid.gov site has all the programs. The problem is, is that you really need an advocate on your side to see what you fit for, because it's a, a lot of detail, a lot of data. It's very complicated and uh, people start going down one path when they really should have chosen another one. And that's why, you know, student loan attorneys like myself and others exist. But yeah, they don't just make random calls saying, oh, you've won the lottery and <laughs> come on down for our, you know, our hundred thousand dollars of forgiveness or something. So no offense, but I hope people don't have to need your services because obviously you hope that they'll be able to easily pay back their student loan debt or, you know, that they would not face economic hardship, but thank goodness that someone like you does exist where would you say the need for your services would start? Would you say it's when somebody is in default or about to default or they you know, have been late on their private uh, student loans and you know, a company asks them they want to reduce their payment? Like When should someone contact an attorney? Well, if we can avoid default, that would save 25% of their loan balance. So we encourage folks that as soon as you realize that you're in trouble with your loans, that they're simply unmanageable they're not sustainable. They want too much money. That's the ideal time to try to resolve them. Uh, We can always deal with them after they've already defaulted to cure the default and get them back in good standing. But again, you you add this unnecessary cost to the balance. We can also address after a lawsuit and even during garnishment. But if a garnishment has already started, then we lose a lot of the leverage because there's already been a judgment usually entered against that person for a state court lawsuit, for instance. So the earlier, the better. We generally don't hear from people when they first graduate because they don't know there's a problem yet. You know, they think, oh, I can make my student loan payment. Everybody seems to do this. You know, it's a common thing. But it's 10 years later, they realize, wow, you know, I'm paying $750 a month and my balance is going up. It's not going down. 
that's an ideal time to reach out, to proactively try to fix it before it does get to default and garnishment and things like that. But we can help really at all stages. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty interesting. Now, when you're talking about, obviously, someone's trying to figure out how to hire an attorney, they're in default. A lot of times people working with not at all people in default or lower income, but you know some of them are obviously. So when you're hiring an attorney, besides obviously finding someone who's knowledgeable, do attorneys that settle student loan debt, is it always typically an hourly rate? It is it sometimes a contingency of what you save for somebody. How does that work? Just at a broad level, not necessarily your firm. It varies. A lot of us, I think, go on flat fees simply because I like flat fees better than a reverse contingency as percentage of the savings, although I'm willing to do that. But flat fees is best because you know what you're getting into. You can budget it. You know exactly what the retainer is going to be, the monthly costs. We do all of ours on installment plans. Most clients can easily afford our fees when we spread it out over time. It's not really a problem um, for anyone. In fact, a A lot of our reviews talk about how inexpensive our fees really are, especially if you compare it to the vast amount of savings that they'll get. Some attorneys probably still do it on an hourly basis. I quit doing that about 10 years ago, though, where I had to keep track of my life in six-minute increments. (laughs) It starts to drive you crazy trying to keep track of everything. But someone can do that, particularly if they feel that it's not going to take very much time. The problem is, is that you just don't know. You know, if there's a bunch of hearings and a lot of, you know, mediation and things like that, it could get a bit crazy. But most of our settlements don't involve lengthy litigation, mediations and depositions and things, although they can, most don't. So we offer a very affordable flat fee. And then I acknowledge that, okay, if I have 10 clients, if nine clients have the routine, but one client has a higher amount of time that we have to spend, we just bill it into what our flat fee is going to be across the board. And uh, we take the chance then. We have the risk on our shoulders rather than one particular client having the risk of an hourly that's gone out of control. Makes sense. I mean, now, last sort of question, I'm going to ask you to predict the future, which is always dangerous. I forget they said that I think predictions are dangerous, especially about the future, right? There's some sort of quip about that. So with this tax-free forgiveness that's expiring in 2026, our position has been that that would eventually go away. But when it does go away, obviously, there's zero incentive for someone not to borrow the absolute maximum for everything, because a lot of people don't borrow the maximum for their program. But if you're very transparently borrowing and paying 10% of your income with no limit on what you can borrow, that's going to eventually get extremely expensive, right? So I guess my question is twofold. Do you think that eventually forgiveness for the 20 and 25-year variety for income-based repayment programs, do you think that's eventually going to be tax-free? And you know, if yes, what do you think will happen with the student loan program at some point when the cost you know, in the 2030s and 40s, just like people are like, oh my gosh, we thought we were going to make a profit and we're losing trillions of dollars. And that's what's happened. I just scanned it briefly, but there was a report recently where uh, a lot less money was being received by the federal government under these income-driven plans than they anticipated. And our government is now currently the biggest bank in the United States. And they're not really made out to be that. They don't really have all the things in place to be the biggest bank. So really, I think that this system does need to have a substantial overhaul. Our federal government doesn't need to be the sole lender, not just lender of last resort, but you know, pretty much the sole lender of all federal loans. And maybe get back to a more a system that you have a little bit more regulation. And I'd like to see schools and servicers and the originating lenders taking some hit if that loan eventually defaults and kind of spreading that risk out. Because right now, if a loan defaults, it's either on that borrower or the taxpayer. The school already got paid. The original lender already got paid. The servicers get their fees and their servicing and origination fees. And there's no there's no blowback to them. And I'd like to see that blowback exist, including the schools. Because if the schools are charging so much for attendance, if what they are offering is never going to repay through a strictly a cost of investment type analysis. You know, if you're if you're buying an education, you should look at what will I earn from that education. And so if a school can't put out graduates that can earn the amount of money to repay that, then maybe some adjustment needs to be made on either the curriculum or the cost or something like that. And I think I've lost my train of thought on what your question was. No, it's just, <laughs> is it going to be tax-free? I mean, I, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have no idea because it all depends on who is in control of Congress at that point. I mean, yeah, I have told people that don't go nuts about doing all kinds of asset planning in the anticipation of having this large taxable event in 25 years, because there is a good chance that Congress will fix that before that. I have regularly said that to folks. And in fact, they're looking to fix it now, but it would have a 
a deadline of 2025 where most of our clients are going to qualify for that well after. So we don't know who's going to be in office then, what the outlook's going to be, what the dollar is going to amount to at that point. (laughs) There's so much uncertainties. I don't think anyone can predict that. Yeah. I mean, I think that 3% rate certainly sounds great. And I think it would be great for a lot of our people. I guess my concern would be about the people that come after. So there's some interesting like research from the New York Federal Reserve that found like when they increased the subsidized student loan limits, they found a, a 60 cents on the dollar capture rate by the schools. So the schools would essentially go and raise tuition by about 60 cents for every dollar that the subsidized loan limits were mm-hmm. increased by. That's why it's, it's such a complicated problem, right? Is because you kind of have to think what should be the fix? What's a fair way to address this? And the problem is, is it can't create these incentives like you're talking about where the right. schools have no skin in the game whatsoever and can just continue to abuse the system. So I don't know. It's just going to be such a fascinating mess to try to unravel and explain to people, right? True. And you don't want borrowers to take advantage and just having a 10% knowing that they're never, ever going to have to repay. So why not? You know, we shall go to Yale. We shall go to Harvard. We're never going to have to repay it. So I agree with you there. We shouldn't disincentivize that. I, I think a lot of things may turn to online learning that might reduce the cost of attendance, and that could help as well. Well, it's interesting with that. I mean, one of the big complaints, one of our people sent me the screenshot of a complaint they filed with their school. They said, why am I being charged during COVID a $5,000 instrument fee when you haven't allowed me to go into the clinic and actually use these instruments? And the school responded very aggressively saying, this is a main campus inquiry. You have no standing whatsoever to be asking this question. And I thought, wow, it's kind of like, you know, when you're looking at a legal settlement, if the person is kind of already offering you a really low amount, they know they're the ones that are probably in the wrong, right? So if you're responding super defensively to a very reasonable question, you do have to wonder when students stand up and just say enough is enough. And maybe this borrower defense to repayment, maybe more people going to all kinds of programs will say, hey, you know, I was misled about the true cost of this. You know, I'm I'm okay financially, but like at least somebody should be paying attention to this stuff. True. Um, So the last question I've got for you, where can people learn more about you, Christy, and where can people contact you if they wanted to look at hiring you for being their attorney? Absolutely. Well, we have a um, email info, info at christyarkovich.com. So it's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-E. And last name is A-R-K-O-V as in Victor, I-C-H. And our phone number is 813-258-2808. We do have quite a lot of free information on our website. There is a webinar on there, a one-hour webinar, how to take your life back from your student loans. Uh, We have a free guide, same thing. There's a lot of uh, different podcasts on specific subjects like public service loan forgiveness or disability issues or private student loan discharge. So if someone wants to know particularly more about their certain situation. And then lastly, if you just want to email or call, we can set a one-on-one consultation. We have a very low consultation fee and we do offer a guarantee for that as well. And so our key is if someone wants to do something themselves, we try to provide the resources on our website to do that. And if they need a little bit more one-on-one attention, don't want to spend the time and effort to try to figure it out on their own, we're there at a reasonable cost to try to you know get the problem over with. Now, that's our philosophy as well. Christy, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. And I like your t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> the student loan planner. <laughs> yeah, I bet the podcast people can't see it. But you know what? Maybe the team has been pushing me to make a merch store because some of the you know the students who go to the highest cost schools said that they wanted to wear our merchandise on campus to kind of troll their deans. Yeah, that'd be a good uh, idea. So, so maybe, maybe we'll do that. I don't know. <laughs> well, I have one on the back of it says, keep calm, call Christy. And then student loan sucks is somewhere on there. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So I was thinking maybe instead of got milk, it could be got death. That question mark. You know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, well, thank you. Thank you for what you do and helping to raise awareness on some things to how to defeat the student loans. Absolutely. Everyone, you have a wonderful week. And until next time, this is the Student Loan Planner Podcast. <laughs>